Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our midweek online prayer meeting. And again, it's good to be first of all coming to God's Word and then coming to the throne of grace, coming to prayer. It's a wonderful place to be. There isn't a better place to be around God's Word and around that wonderful place called the throne of grace. I want to turn to Hebrews chapter 4, well-known verse regarding this place, Hebrews 4 verse 16. I'm asking the question again that I asked last week, and that is, do you pray? Remember the hymn again? I often say my prayers, but do I ever pray? Well, we need to, we need to focus on that. We need to be sure that we're really praying. Well, the Bible gives us great encouragement to pray. And I want to look at those encouragements tonight. Let me look at this one. He says, let us therefore. Why does he say therefore? Always ask why it's therefore. Because he's told us we've got a great high priest. Not only a great high priest, but one who sympathises with our weaknesses. One who is in heaven waiting to hear us pray. Let us therefore come boldly, verse 16, Hebrews 4. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Never tired of reading that. How wonderfully encouraging it is. Remember in Hebrews 10 we saw in uh, devotions a few weeks back that we, we've got boldness to enter the most holy place. Boldness to come, he says here, to the throne of grace. Let's come boldly to the throne of grace. Confidently, that's what he means. With confidence. While Jesus is there at the throne of grace and he's waiting for us and he's looking forward to hearing our prayers. That's a thrilling and a marvellous truth, isn't it? I have a book on my desk, a little book that I sometimes use. I don't always use daily devotionals in books. I've gone... A uh, shelf full that I've gone through, but this one I've used in the past. Um, I use an online study at the minute. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's a book by Spurgeon called the the Checkbook of Faith, the Checkbook of Faith Daily Readings. I want to read to you what he says in the preface. Listen to this: A promise from God may be very intrusively be compared to a check payable to order. So he's likening God's promises to a to a banker's cheque. That's why he calls it the checkbook of faith. He is to treat the promise as a reality, as a man treats a cheque. He is to take the promise and endorse it with his own name by personally receiving it as true. He is by faith to accept it as his own. He must believingly present the promise to the Lord as a man presents a cheque at the counter at the bank. He must plead it by prayer, expecting to have it fulfilled. If he has come to heaven's bank, he will receive the promised amount at once, if it is, of course, at the right date. If the date should happen to be further on, he must patiently wait till its arrival. But meanwhile, he must count the promise as money, for the bank is sure to pay when the due time arrives. God's promises, you see what he's saying? Treat them like a cheque. Presented at the bank. God has given, I love this, no pledge which he will not redeem. And encourage no hope which he will not fulfil. Isn't that marvellous? That's a great encouragement to pray, isn't it? That's what Spurgeon's getting at. An encouragement to pray. You can also think of a cheque like this. A cheque without a signature. Have you ever had one of them? Somebody forgot to sign it? It's a, it's a worthless piece of paper. You'll take it to the bank and the cashier will pass it back to you and say, or you put it in the machine and it'll reject it. And it'll say, can't accept this cheque. Why not? Well, you say, what's wrong with it? And they say, well, it's the amount's filled in. It's all there, but I can't cash it. It's not worth anything because they haven't signed it. They haven't signed it. Well, it's a worthless piece of paper. The signature is what gives it the value what makes it worth anything? Well, God has put his name in the same way God has put his name to his promises and makes them, that what's what makes them of great value to us as Christians. Now, we're to say, uh, 
you know that we believe these promises and receive them it's it's very similar with faith it's not the amount of faith that's required not the size of our faith but what our faith is in that's the key i've always taught that it's what our faith is in it's the same with god's promises it, it it's not our prayers or the amount of prayer it, it's it's the fact that god has made a promise that when we pray we're to lay hold of that promise and we're to believe the promises of God. I remember um, we had at the weekend uh, an example of testimonies from the Lewis revival. It wasn't in those testimonies but those, those two old ladies that prayed for revival before it came just laid hold of the promises of God. They told the minister, has he not promised? Does it not say it in his word? He poured water on the thirsty, floods on the dry ground. So they held God to the promise and they kept on pleading the promise. That's the way God encourages us to pray. And I want to look at a, a couple of examples, well, two or three examples of, of great promises for prayer in the Bible. Let's turn first of all to the Old Testament, to Jeremiah uh, and chapter 33. Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 3. Somebody cornerly coined this as God's telephone number, Jeremiah 333. Uh, it's quite amusing, but it's, it's true, because look at this. Look at Jeremiah 33, verse 3. Call to me, and I will answer you. Call to me, and I may answer you. I think about answering you. I could answer you. Call to me, and I will answer you, and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Isn't that a spectacular promise for prayer? It's absolutely marvellous. It's wonderful. Then I'll give you another if you turn to the Gospel of John and chapter 14. I've been looking a lot this recent weeks at John 14 and I'm beginning really a series back in John 14. We're looking at heaven uh, last Sunday and I'm going to be looking at the further aspects of what Jesus says about that in John 14. But this marvellous promise in John 14 verse 13, it doesn't get better than this. And whatever you ask, John 14 verse 13, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Whatever you ask in my name. You see, to, to pray in Jesus' name is not just to say in Jesus' name. It's to pray with all the authority that this promise has been made in his name. You see, we're asking, but we're asking according to the promises that he has made himself. In my name, in his name, I will do whatever you ask in my name, uh, I will do. How about that? I will do. Uh, there is a great incentive to prayer. Now I want to turn to one other, it's in, it's in Luke's Gospel and chapter 11. Luke's Gospel chapter 11, I've often spoke on this passage. I want to read from verse 9, Luke 11 verse 9. Do you remember how Jesus puts it? It's, it says the same in Matthew's Gospel but it's put differently here because we have a little bit more. So I say to you, ask and it will be given you. How about that? It will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And Tim who knocks, it will be opened. Doesn't get more clearer than that, does it? Jesus says, and I say to you, I, with all the authority of Christ, say to you, you ask and you'll receive. You seek and you'll find. You knock and the door will be opened. It's a great incentive to prayer. And if that wasn't enough, it's sandwiched between uh, uh, a wonderful lesson at the end an application and before that the parable do you remember the parable of the friend at midnight oh listen to what jesus says he says uh, which of you shall have a friend verse five and go to him at midnight and say friend lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has come to me on a journey i have nothing to set before him i have no food to give him and he will answer from within and say, Don't trouble me now, the door is shut, my children are with me in bed, I cannot rise and give you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give you because he is friend, yet because of his persistence he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Then he says, Ask, seek and knock. The only reason he got the bread was because he wasn't going away. He had to give him the bread to get rid of him. 
It's the same with the unjust judge and the importunate widow. She refuses to say, take no for an answer. Just give her what she asked for. And do you remember the Lord applied that one? And, 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 and will not God give to his own elect to cry to him day and night? Nevertheless, when I come again, will I really find faith? It's all about faith and believe in the promises of God. But there's the incentive. And the best application is verse 11. If a son asks for a bread from a father among you, will you give him a stone? If he asks for a fish, will you give him a scorpion, a serpent instead? Or if he asks, sorry, for an egg, will you offer him a scorpion? You know, you being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly father give? And the promise there is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit to them that ask him. What an incentive. All those promises that I've just read have to be received by faith. When you pray, pray believing. That's what he's saying. Pray believing. Uh, that's the whole idea of the parable. That's the whole idea of the lessons. But we have to believe. Now the Bible is full of these. I don't need to remind you. It's absolutely ram full. Uh, about people, examples of not only God's incentives to us, but men have laid hold of them and have proved them. You've got Joshua. Do you remember he prayed? What happened to Joshua? Oh, no minor thing. The earth stood still. I need more time, Lord. Speak to the sun. The earth stood still. It's not possible for that to happen. It's impossible. Of course it is. But God did the impossible. And the sun stood still. The Bible says, never was there a day like it before or since. The point is, God was willing to listen to a man who asked for this. Elijah prayed, it says, and it didn't rain. Elijah prayed again and it rained for three and a half years. The greatest one, the greatest one is when he prayed and fire came down from heaven on Mount Carmel. He listened to a man. He said, James says he's a man just like us, with like passions just like us, but God heard him. Now Peter prayed, do you remember him? The Apostle Peter, he prayed and the lame beggar walked. Silver and gold I don't have, but what I have I give. You know, he, there's this answer to prayer. Ezra prayed, and what happened to Ezra? Well, revival broke out at the end of his prayer. How marvellous a prayer that was. Daniel prayed, and it says the Lord Jesus came to him. And ever since you began to humble yourself and pray, I was coming to you. How thrilling that is. And he met the Lord in the Old Testament. Oh, what a marvellous thing. The church prayed in Acts chapter 4 and the building was shaken. We saw that on, on Sunday night with the, with the church in Lewis. But it was there in Acts chapter 4 and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Paul and Silas prayed. At midnight there was an earthquake. What about that? An earthquake. And what happened as a result of it? Well, the Philippian jailer and all his household were converted. They were saved. You see, the Bible puts it to us like this. God says, call upon me and I will answer you. He puts it like this in another place. With God, nothing, nothing shall be impossible. What an encouragement to pray. We are given so many. Oh, they're marvellous. Listen, listen to this again by uh, uh, one of the hymns I want to quote it. I've quoted it many times. I haven't quoted it in this series, I don't think. You remember this? How firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. There's your foundation. It's laid in God's word. But I love this line. Think about this as we come to prayer tonight. What more can he say than to you he has said? What more can God say than he's already said? To you and to Jesus for refuge have fled. What more can God say in his word to us than he's already said? The question is, are we going to believe him? Spurgeon says this, God has given no pledge which he will not redeem and encouraged no hope which he will not fear fulfill what a truth that is well do you pray we have every reason to pray we have every encouragement to pray well God grant us to pray and lay hold as our forefathers have done before us on the promises of God in his word God bless us tonight as we pray
Amen. Let's affirm what we've just heard from Ligon. How firm the foundation you say of the Lord is. 